Good evening, and welcome to the Gene Therapy Basics webinar. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Wendy Owens. I am HFA's Director of Research. Before you get, we get started tonight, I'd like to go over a few helpful webinar tips. We welcome your questions during the webinar. Uh, however, your audio will be muted during the entirety of the webinar, as this helps limit background noise that may disrupt the presentation. If you have a question, please type the question in the question box located at the bottom of your control panel. I will relay your questions at the end of the webinar to the presenter. Tonight's presentation is part two of Gene Therapy Basics, developed in cooperation between the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy and the Hemophilia Federation of America. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Mark Kay, and to give a thank you to our sponsors, Spark Therapeutic and Unicure. Some background on Dr. K. Dr. Mark K is the Dennis Ferry Family Professor in the Departments of Pediatrics and Genetics at Stanford University. He is the head of the Division of Human Gene Therapy and serves as the Associate Chair of Basic Research in Pediatrics. He received a PhD in Developmental Genetics and MD from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland and did his, candidate's, I'm sorry, his clinical residency in pediatrics and medical genetics at the Baylor College of Medicine. Dr. K was on the founding board of directors at the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy and served as the society's vice president, president-elect, and president in 2003 to 2006. He received the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy's Outstanding Investigator Award in 2013. He is a scientific founder of Voyager Therapeutics and logic biotherapeutics. The focus of Dr. K's laboratory is to establish the scientific principles required for gene and nucleic acid transfer for the treatment of genetic and acquired diseases. Dr. K held the IND in which AAV was first systematically administered into humans, and this was for hemophilia B. We look forward to hearing more about that this evening. Dr. K, I will hand the presentation over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I appreciate everyone's uh, patience and attention. Uh, I wanted to uh, um, go over um, one point that I, that I made last time. Last time we talked about different uh, gene transfer strategies to accomplish different goals that included genome editing uh, and supplying all sorts of nucleic acids in, in different settings. So to remind you, one of the uh, goals that we um, wanted to accomplish was to restore a missing gene function by supplying a protein that's missing in the disease state. And if you look at the coagulation cascade, you can see that there are a lot of different proteins that are needed for normal blood coagulation. So in the deficiency of factor IX, as shown in red and where my arrow is, and in factor VIII results in a very similar bleeding diathesis, hemophilia. But of course, for each of the respective disorders, factor IX or factor VIII deficiency, even though the two disorders are clinically similar, we need to replace the right gene in order to correct the disease. So if we look at hemophilia over a period of time, the reason why hemophilia was such um, a target for gene therapeutic development. I mean, if you look back into the late 80s, early 90s, there was a lot of interest in trying to treat hemophilia. And that's because there were both small and large animal models that recapitulated the human disorder in a relatively similar manner. That is the bleeding diathesis in the hemophilia B and hemophilia A dog model is very similar to the human disorder. We also knew that there was a good correlation between the level of factor and the severity of disease. So if somebody had no detectable level or less than 1%, whether it be factor eight or nine, they had severe hemophilia and individuals who had more than a couple percent up to maybe 5% or so had a um, more uh, moderate type of disease. And then those individuals that had higher levels than that, but 
let's say up to 20% had a, had a very mild form of the disorder. And we know that as little as one to 2% reconstitution can really make a clinical difference in the individual's life based on the severity of the disorder. And another thing that's important to point out is that there was no need to have strict gene regulation as there might be in trying to treat something like diabetes because obviously too much insulin uh, can make the blood sugar so low that, that that would be incompatible with life. The bottom line is we knew exactly how much coagulation factor we needed to get to what type of correction of the disorder and um, we could measure the gene product that is the factor by simply measuring the blood. Unlike other enzyme deficiencies, let's say from the liver where the factor is normally made, to get a direct quantification of the protein that we're trying to replace would require liver biopsy. So again, there's a lot of reasons why people had interest in trying to treat hemophilia. Now, there were a number of uh, gene therapy trials uh, in humans for hemophilia, and I don't want to go through all, all of them. I'll say that there were some ex vivo approaches where there were um, groups that tried to put the gene into cells that were removed from the body, different types of cells, and they used either a retrovirus or, or a, um, um, a plasmid and then reimplant the genetically modified cells back into the, into the individual. And these really didn't work. There was also um, uh, intravascular injection of a of retrovirus uh, vector that was tried in around the same era. That didn't work. Intramuscular injection of recombinant AEV vectors were tried in the late 90s, but sustained levels of therapeutic uh, factor nine was not achieved. And really what we see today is that there are quite a few liver-based recombinant AEV vector delivery uh, of either um, a, a vector that would express factor nine or factor eight. And this is what I wanna focus on. If you look at AAV or adeno-associated virus, the vector that's developed comes from a wild-type virus that was isolated in nature back in uh, early 1960s. And this virus has, it's, uh, as, as part of its normal genetic makeup, has two genes, rep, which is involved in replicating the DNA of the virus, and cap, which is involved in encapsulating the DNA that's newly synthesized. And it turns out that sequences, protein differences in the cap sequence can have profound effects on the ability of the um, vector or virus to infect a certain species or cell type. And I'll talk about this in more detail in a moment. But what gene therapists do is they basically take out the rep and cap gene and they put their therapeutic gene in under a promoter that drives the expression of the therapeutic gene once the vector DNA gets into the um, designated tissue. And in this case, we're talking about either factor eight or factor nine. So again, this is the general principle of, uh, around um, these AEV vectors. And AEV as a wild type virus isn't known to cause any human disease. Now, when the vectors get into the cell, let's say the liver cell, it has to go get into the nucleus. And I talked about the long road that vectors have to take from the time they attach to the cell to get into the nucleus. So I won't go over that point again. But I do want to make a point is that most of the AAV genomes uh, are, are present as episomal DNA. And what this means is it, that it's not covalently or chemically attached to our chromosomal DNA. And this is important because if you're putting this vector into cells and the cells divide, um, whether it's due to normal growth or some sort of regeneration or normal turnover, you'll actually lose these genomes. If the DNA is attached to the chromosome in a chemical manner and inserts itself into our chromosomal DNA, then as long as these cells or its daughter cells uh, persist, you, you could in theory get lifelong 
um, expression or presence of the of gene modified cells in that individual. And this is an important point that I'll come back to later. Now it turns out with AAV, a very small percentage does integrate into regions of our chromosome. And I, I'll mention later why this is important. It really isn't responsible for any of the expression of factor eight or nine but it can have some other effects that I, I just wanna make you aware of at the end of the talk. So groups like ourselves and others made AEV vectors that express initially uh, factor nine, and we were able to test these both in mice and then in hemophilia B dogs. And then we went into humans, and this is uh, one slide from a study that was published in 2006. And the level of factor nine went up to uh, from undetectable levels to a level of about 12 percent and in dogs or mice once a level was achieved for all intent and purposes it persisted for many years in fact the dogs are out like eight or so years and the, the mice live two years two years and the the factor level continued but something different occurred in humans that hadn't been observed in any animals and that is the level fell after a period of weeks. And this correlated with a rise in liver enzymes, which is just a measure of some sort of liver insult. And it turns out that in humans, again, this is different than what happens in any animal models. And, and people haven't even been able to replicate this in uh, non-human primates, monkeys, is that there is a, an immune response against the vector capsid, that is that capsid that encircles and, and basically encapsidates the therapeutic DNA, that leads to an elimination of the cells that have taken up the AAV vector. And obviously then you lose expression. Now it turns out this type of a rise in liver enzymes by itself isn't dangerous. This is something that probably happens if you go out and have too many drinks and maybe take some acetaminophen afterwards. But at the time, we didn't know what was causing this. And this turns out that this study that was published in 2006 was the first demonstration of therapeutic uh, human factor nine. And this study, again, uh, as I, I, I do provide the reference, was a collaboration between my group, Kathy High, and at the time, a company called Avigen. But unlike all the animal models, expression in humans turned out to be temporary. And this was due to this immune response. And really, the point here is that no matter how good the animal models, you can't predict the outcome in humans until you try it in people. Now, it turns out there's a trick you can do. And you can take the AV2 capsid, and you can take this in encapsulate the exact same DNA that expresses factor eight or nine, and you can put it into different AAV capsids. And at the time, in the back, you know, a, a decade or two ago, there were like six different serotypes that have been isolated in nature. And what it was starting to be learned was that these different uh, capsids, which had different sequences, protein sequences, had different properties. And what was done was a process called pseudotyping, where you would try these different vectors to see how well they worked in, in various animals. And AV8 was a, a vector or capsid or isolated as a, as a wild type AV by Jim Wilson and Guangping, um, Guangping uh, Gao at, at the University of Pennsylvania. And we and others did careful quantification of mouse livers that had been injected with a marker gene that turned cells blue when we used AV2 versus AV8. And you can see that the same dose of AV8 resulted in a lot more gene expression in, the, in these mouse livers than AV2. So there was a lot of reasons why somebody might want to go and use AV8 now. First of all, it was isolated from a non-human primate, so maybe humans wouldn't have this immune response against it. And secondly, in theory, it should provide much higher levels of transgene expression. So in a trial that was performed and published by Nathwani et al. 
that I participated in. It was a study done um, at, at St. Jude's and at University College London. The AEV-8 capsid was used to encapsidate the factor IX uh, gene, uh, gene. And what we see here is that the factor IX levels reached about the same level. And some of the patients developed a transaminitis, and we were ready for it this time because previously it was totally unexpected. But this time we were concerned that it could occur. So what we did was that these patients got treated with a short dose of oral steroids, which have very little risk associated with it. And this could abrogate the uh, continued removal of the liver cells that had taken up the AAV vector. And as a result of that, you could get sustained levels of factor IX that have persisted out well now well over three years as shown here. So this LFT elevation and this T cell response is a nuance for sure, but it's not a showstopper because it can be treated with the transient uh, administration of oral steroids, which have very little risk associated with it. But one of the issues that comes up here is how does one predict the clinical outcomes from animal studies? If you look at that AV8 data, as I mentioned, based on animal studies, it was predicted that AV8 should give 10 to 20 times higher levels of factor IX than the AV2 trial did, because this is what was shown in the animal mo models. And it really was quite a bit lower. So one of the problems or one of the challenges in the gene therapy area, regardless of whether it's hemophilia, is how do you predict from animal studies into humans? How do you pick the right serotype? Now, one other model that we developed in terms of using it as a way of testing um, for uh, gene transfer and, and possible correlation to a human trial is based on a mouse model that was developed by Marcus Grumpy's lab in which there's a way you can trick the mouse into actually losing its mouse liver cells. And at that time, you implant human liver cells that are obtained from cadaver samples or, or biopsies, and that those liver cells will, will repopulate the mouse liver such that the mouse now has a chimeric liver that's made up of human cells and mouse cells. And then you can look at the AAV serotypes in those and ask which serotypes actually transduce the mouse, human mouse cells, I'm, I'm sorry, the human cells in this chimeric liver more efficiently. And sure enough, if you look at that, we actually found that AV2 and 8 transduce or, or express from human cells in about an equal amount, which is what was pretty much found in the human clinical trial. So although this model isn't perfect and it has its own issues, it is another model out there that can be used to try to select for the right capsid or enhanced capsid that can be used in the clinical trials. Now you can use this model for other things as well. So one of the approaches that we've taken, and there's many different variations on, on this theme, is that you can now make libraries of capsids. That is, you can make capsids that are derived from all sorts of, all sorts of different uh, natural occurring capsids in nature from all sorts of species. And in the age of, of uh, uh, high throughput sequencing now, hundreds of thousands of different AV variants have been isolated or at least sequenced. So you can take these sequences and you can randomize them and put them in and make capsid libraries. And there, in these libraries, there's something like a, a million different variants. And then what you can do is you can passage them through these humanized mice in a way that you're only isolating the, the variants that infect the human cells in this chimeric liver. And then you can sequence the variants that tend to 
be predominantly um, passaged in these animals. And then you can make vectors from these and ultimately test them in back in the humanized mouse, or you can test them in um, uh, ultimately clinical trials. And some of these now are being tested in clinical trials. Now, if we look at the clinical trials for hemophilia, as I mentioned, there were two previous academic trials, the Stanford CHOP trial with AAV2 and the UCL St. Jude trial with AAV8. But there are now some commercial trials in which the preliminary data have been presented at various meetings. And these were done by Spark, Unicure, Dimension, Shire, and um, Sangamo has a genome editing factor nine trial that has been um, approved for phase one testing, but as far as I know, no patients have been treated. But probably the most encouraging data right now is the SPARC data in which um, they uh, presented uh, 10 patients and the, the trial continues with levels that were uh, of factor nine between 12 and 65%, the mean was 33%. And this resulted in a 96% decrease in bleeding episodes and a 99% decrease in the need for human factor IX infusion. So this looks very promising. And the hemophilia A trials, which are um, more recent, are, have been performed by Biomarin and Spark. And Sangamo recently um, announced that their trial is starting. The Biomarin factor eight level in patients were very wide ranging, and it varied between a couple of percent to over 200%. And the reason for this isn't clear at this point. Spark recently presented the data from their first two patients and reported levels of 11 to 14%, but they used a dose of vector that was 100 times lower than Biomarin. So again, I think that over time, you're going to see these two trials and, and what the outcomes are. And I think this is something that uh, both of these trials are very important to, to watch in, over the, the coming months. And again, I think the Sangamo trial will be starting, and there'll be great interest in their results as well. So I, I want to end with a couple points. What are the differences between the, the different trials? Why do we see different results? There's a lot of variables between these trials. And one of the biggest one is vector serotypes. These different trials use different serotypes. And even though there's preclinical testing in animals, as I said, we really don't know which animal model is best, if any, to predict human outcomes. The regulatory sequence is driving expression of the factor eight or factor nine varies in the different trials. As I mentioned, you need something called a promoter that basically drives the expression of the transgene. And every promoter used, there's some differences in, in what's uh, used and selected. The other thing is one of the reasons Spark data, they had such high levels of activity is they use the hyperactive Padua variant. This is a naturally occurring um, variant in, in the human population that leads to hyperactive uh, factor IX compared to what most people have. And because it's found in nature and there's been no predicted problems with, with Padua, it was used in the trial. But obviously for other proteins, we don't always have hyperactive variants to choose from. The fourth parameter is dosing, that these different trials use different doses, and uh, determining the dose that's actually used can vary based on how you measure dose. And there's differences in manufacturing methodologies. And some of these, including the purification scheme, could play a role in efficacy. One major variation is that some of these vectors are made in human, uh, in human mammalian cell lines. And in other uh, scenarios, the vectors are made in insect cells. And there's pluses and minuses to both of these approaches. And this is something that if you're interested in, we can discuss in the Q&A. So what are the challenges 
that we face moving forward. How do we include patients, for example, that with pre-existing immunity? What I didn't mention is that every one of these AAV serotypes, there are a certain percentage of individuals in the human population who have a high level of neutralizing antibody because they've been exposed to some type of AAV in the wild type in nature that led to an antibody response that perhaps cross-reacts with the serotype that's being used in the trial, or perhaps they were infected with that particular serotype, and those patients are excluded. So how do we get around that problem? It may be that for every disease for entity, like for let's say factor nine, you may have three or four different serotypes to choose from, and the patients will be select will be uh, evaluated for neutralizing antibody titers, and they'll get the vector for which they have the lowest or no neutralizing antibody. We still don't know how long it's going to last in the liver. Is it going to last three to five years, ten years? Readministration is a problem because they're getting a high dose of vector, and the patients, all of them, develop high levels of neutralizing antibodies that will probably persist at some tighter lifelong, and whether or not there's a way to find another uh, serotype that won't cross-react is unclear. There are strategies that people are trying to develop so that at the time that the AAV is administered, they will block any immune response that would lead to antibodies that would block, uh, that, that would basically allow them to be readministered a, a second dose at a later time. Now, as I mentioned, too, that there's a small proportion of these AAV genomes that integrate into the, into the liver cells. And even though it's something like on the order of 0.1%, it's still, at the doses given, something like hundreds of millions of integrations. And there have been studies in mice, in large populations of mice, that are given high dose of AAV and in some of those studies, up to 75% of the animals develop hepatocellular carcinoma because the AEV integrated next to a proto-oncogene or a, a gene that's known to cause cancer. And the promoter in the vector drives the expression and turns that oncogene back on, and that leads to hepatocellular carcinoma. And this is something that I think we have to be aware of. We don't know what the risk is in humans. It's not zero, but it may not be large. But this is something that I think that everyone needs to be aware of and keep their eyes open. We don't know if this will happen in adults, and we don't know if this is going to happen in humans. The other issue is how do we treat children? There's a lot of data in, in monkey and in mouse that if you treat animals in the neonatal period, they lose their vector because the liver is growing and during growth, you lose the vector genomes over a period of several weeks. And again, readministration is going to be an issue. There are other strategies that you could use that include AAV with genome editing strategies using a nuclease like CRISPR-Cas9 or a zinc finger that will allow um, integration into a, a site in the chromosome. And that would allow a single administration and lifelong expression. There are some potential problems with this. There's another approach called GeneRide, which is an homologous recombination that doesn't use um, a, a nuclease um, that would uh, also, if, if successful in humans, would lead to lifelong expression, even if administered in the neonatal period. And then the manufacturing issues, the differences, manufacturing enough to treat all the patients, these are still challenges that um, there's quite a bit of effort and interest in, in uh, uh, currently. So with that, um, I'll end my uh, um, this uh, lecture and uh, open it up for any questions that the uh, um, participants may have. Thank you, Dr. Kay.
So now if you have questions, you'll see on your dashboard the opportunity uh, under the little question tab to, to ask. Uh, so please just type that in and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we do have our first question, Dr. K. Um, first question is, how will the therapies be administered? And uh, together with that, are there potential side effects of the administration of the therapy? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Uh, say that, I, I missed that. Sorry, say that again? That's okay. How will the therapies be administered? And what oh. are the potential side effects of the administration of the therapy? Right. So right now, um, these AAVs are, are delivered by simple um, intravenous infusion uh, peripherally. So it can be given in, in the arm or uh, it's, it's, it's as simple as an IV infusion. And as far as I'm aware, there's no acute toxicity that's been observed with the AAV vector administration at this point. The only issue has been this uh, LFT uh, liver enzyme or uh, elevation that occurs subsequently over some period of weeks after the administration. It doesn't occur in all patients. And in some of the trials, there's been differences in uh, the number of patients that have had the LFT elevation, the timing of it, and, and things along those lines. And again, we don't totally understand the variation at this point. But as far as I'm aware, nobody's had a serious uh, life-threatening uh, event from uh, AAV trial for hemophilia at this point. Great, thank you. We have our next question. I have type 3 von Willebrand's. What will this do for me? Well, you know, I, um, I can't recall exactly what the mutation is in type uh, 3 von Willebrand's, and I'm not a... Um, I'm not a hematologist, so and and the the von the von Willebrand's gene is a little bit larger, and uh, that's one point that I I didn't mention. But one of the limitations of AEV, and one of the reasons why it's taken so long to get factor eight in, into the uh, clinical trial, is that there's a limitation as to the size of the gene that you can put into AEV, and you need to have a little extra space to put the regulatory elements. And it's taken a while to optimize that for factor eight. And I can't answer that question off the top of my head. So, but I do know von Willebrand uh, is a larger gene and I think there are uh, differences in the type of mutations and whether they're gain of function or loss of function. So um, if if it's uh, I, I this is something I could easily look up and get back to you on. So if if the organizers want to um, get the information, I'm happy to to respond. That later. Was, yeah, we will go ahead and see if they'll they'll pass along their information there. Um, and if you'd like to, the person who asked that question, please just uh, pass along your information again in the question. If you're interested in response from Dr. K, and we'll, we'll get that information to you. Uh, and the next question. Uh, it reads, as far as I know, the latest data presented by Spark Therapeutics is in its hemophilia B trial was from August 2016. Do you have any more recent data? Um, I think the data that I mentioned was updated in uh, April 2017 or sometime in early 2017. Um, and... Um, and that's the latest that I'm aware of. Okay, thank the you. The ten patients that I mentioned with the, with the where I gave the the median uh, levels as well as the uh, the range, and and it's persisted. I I think that some of these patients have been followed now for um, almost a year. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is: Can this treatment cause an inhibitor? So that's a really great question, and um, the the answer is we don't know. When we started this trial um, years back, we um, there were patients who had certain mutations that we excluded from the trial. So with factor nine, uh, inhibitors are rare, but if they happen, they're sometimes harder to treat. So. We haven't seen any inhibitors yet, 
one of the ways of treating inhibitors is to give sustained levels of, of uh, protein factor. And um, so here we have ex uh, a sustained expression. So there's a possibility that the incidence of inhibitors will be less with gene therapy. Delivering the protein through an intravenous infusion versus having the protein made in the liver can provide different immunologic signals that could either increase or lessen the probability of inhibitors. And I think what's going to be um, important is with the factor VIII trial, because those uh, patients with factor VIII have a higher incidence of inhibitors, and there just haven't been that many patients treated yet. So I think this is something that um, we're all cognizant of and something that we'll be paid close attention to. But if I had to predict based on my understanding of what's known about inhibitor formation, I think that the incidence of inhibitors will be much less using uh, a, a gene therapy approach, this type of gene therapy approach. There may be other approaches that would make the likelihood higher, but I think when you're using this type of AAV vector with a promoter that's restricted to expression in the liver cells, that the incidence of inhibitors is going to be lower, much lower than what you'll see with protein treatment. But that's just a hypothesis. Great, thank you very much. Our next question is, what do you think, why do you think there is concern about participating in gene therapy from potential patients? How do we dis demystify the community? Right, I, I think this is important, and I think that education is critically important. The hemophilia community is well aware, it has a historical past where um, they were given uh, experimental uh, types of uh, therapy, um, different types of um, factor preparations. And as a result, there was a period of time when um, a large population of individuals with hemophilia became infected with uh, hepatitis C or HIV. So I think the hemophilia community in general is um, aware and hyper aware of participating in trials. So I, all I can say is that um, education's important. Um, and the fact is that, um, you know, gene therapy had a, a checkered history uh, prior uh, to, to, to these trials. In general, I mean, there was the Jesse Gels Gelsinger death. There were quite a few trials and hype and promises in the early 1990s that gene therapy in five years was was going to cure all these diseases and nothing happened. Uh, and, and then there was a death in, in, in a trial. So gene therapy kind of got a, a black eye. but And it's taken time to get itself out of that, and I think education's important, um, and, and that's probably the most uh, critical factor. I mean, I believe that people overhype gene therapy in the 1990s, and if you look at all other types of novel therapeutics that are now in the clinic, they've all taken one to two decades. Bone marrow transplantation, initially all the patients who underwent bone marrow transplant died, and there were a lot of um, modifications to the protocols that had to be made so that the, the treatment successful. Same thing with monoclonal antibodies. And gene therapy fits into that same timeline. And it takes time to go from the animal studies to the clinical trials because obviously there's a lot of regulatory steps, the uh, purity and the manufacturing. It's a whole different ballgame. And, and it's very expensive to do these trials. So. So that's why it takes more time. But I, but I think education is, is number one. And, and if I had a loved one uh, or, or even a patient to per, that wanted to participate in a trial, I, I think that they need to learn as much as they can before they, they agree to anything. 
Thank you very much. The next question is, um, I'm just going to summarize it here. Are, is, are companies using anything other than the AAV vectors to transfer the genes into the body? Well, um, there are other vectors that are being used in ex vivo approaches um, that, and quite successfully. And I talked a little bit about that last uh, webinar. They take um, like hemopoietic derived uh, cells out of the body and they use a lentivirus or retroviral vector and insert a therapeutic gene and then uh, transplant those cells back into the body. There are some limited other types of vectors being used for direct in vivo uh, infusion. Uh, there's been some vectors injected in localized spots for um, uh, to try to, to induce an immune response against an antigen uh, as a vaccine like adenovirus, herpes virus. But there aren't that many vectors that are uh, Get being given systemically into patients for general uptake by the liver. Adenovirus was one where we learned a lesson because a patient died from, from a toxic response from the adenovirus. And there have been attempts to use uh, non-viral vectors. And, and again, I do some work on that as well, but, but they just don't work to the same level of efficacy and or they have a level of toxicity that just isn't tolerated. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't things that people are working on now that won't someday be transferred into the clinic uh, to use. But right now, for in vivo delivery into AV is the predominant uh, vector system. Thank you very much. Our next question is, uh, what when, uh, when do we expect these treatments to be available? Well, do you mean, uh, so I guess the question means as a uh, commercial uh, approved licensed product. I would say I, I think for, Yeah, so I think for factor nine, it's a matter of, of a, not too many more years. Um, factor eight, I, I think you could make a better prediction in six to 12 months once there's more of the phase one, two clinical data uh, that's available. And, uh, and uh, presuming that there's no um, severe adverse events that occur from AAV, such as a liver tumor, things like that. I mean, if you give enough people AAV, you're gonna get somebody who has a liver tumor because liver tumors occur in the general population. Um, but but whether you find a tumor that is believed to be induced by AAV, which can be determined by molecular studies, um, might slow down the pr uh, ability to get something approved. But but barring that, I, I think for factor nine, we're talking a couple of years. Thank you. So if anyone has any more questions, please feel free to type those in. Uh, we'll give it a couple of minutes here and just wait for that. Okay, I, I'm not getting any more questions here, Dr. K. Uh, I want to say thank you to you very much for doing both of these webinars. We appreciate your participation and all the information that you have provided, which has been amazing. Um, I would say to our participants, if you have any additional questions, please contact HFA at our research uh, at hemophiliafed.org, and we'll be happy to pass those along to Dr. K and have a response back to you. We also ask you to please um, complete the short evaluation that will pop up on your screen once this webinar concludes, or if you prefer, respond to the request for feedback email that you will receive tomorrow if you provided your email today. So thank you again for your participation. Many thanks to Dr. K and to our sponsors, Spark and Unicure, and to the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy for providing this webinar service in collaboration with HFA. I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you. Thank you.